Hello, everybody. It's a big honor to be here today. And so we have such a crucial topic on how far Bitcoin is uh, from the mass adoption. And Bitcoin is pumping right now. It's already broke uh, $58,400. And as well, this year uh, has been quite uh, uh, groundbreaking for Bitcoin and for the crypto industry. It is finally some kind of legitimized uh, with uh, CEC. Uh, approval of all Bitcoin for ETF applications. And uh, we see big interest from all these biggest asset managers in the world with trillion dollars uh, under management, such as BlackRock, Fidelity, uh, Franklin Tampton, Bitwise, and many others. Uh, so uh, Bitcoin uh, spot ETFs already attracted over $300,000 in uh, 300,000 Bitcoins was over $17 billion. Uh, so uh, my first question is, is uh, how, uh, and as well, uh, Bitcoin Spot ETF uh, became the second uh, most uh, traded uh, commodity ETF in the US. Uh, so in, uh, my first question is, in your opinion, how does this ETF impact the perception and uh, adoption of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? As, uh, let's start with Kavita. Thank you, Anna. Um, of course, I mean, institutional adoption of any currency, especially Bitcoin. And it's very funny. I was thinking about it. Seven years back, everybody was telling us, we're going to go to jail if you have Bitcoin and Ether. <laughs> and now all those people are like trying and book ETFs. So we have come a long way in a very short span of time from being completely illegal to very legalized people on the main stage. Um, I think it's a huge, huge thing because you already have multi-billion dollar locked uh, for Bitcoin ETFs. And apart from Bitcoin ETFs and the Bitcoin halving, which is about to happen in April and May, I feel like the idea that Bitcoin is a very legal source of not just the storage value, but has a technology behind it, has been really rallying it up. So I'm very excited about that. Dominic? So, uh, Rabbi, yes, yeah, I, I was going to say, I think... I think the key, actually, and I think of this, obviously, we're, we're a game company, so I think of a lot of things about uh, creating user acquisition funnels and thinking about distribution. And so for Bitcoin, you know, having these ETFs approved is essentially a huge vector for distribution because now you have some of the biggest money managers in the world who are giving access to their client bases to invest in something which for them has maybe been a, a technical challenge. Maybe people are not comfortable with you know, self-custody of this asset, even though for us here, you know, maybe we're a little bit more technically savvy and don't mind holding a Bitcoin in our own wallet. For a lot of traditional investors, especially institutional investors, they want professional custody. Um, so I think that this really opens up the market to a whole new class of investors who might have been interested in it, but didn't really have access and wanted an easy way to have access with an institution they trust. Thank you, Dominic. Well, um, ETF approval obviously is fantastic news for Bitcoin. Um, it, it allows people to invest in Bitcoin much more easily. And, and what, what's interesting about that is, you know, whereas, um, you know, if you, in, if you invest in Apple stock, that's not the same as using an iPhone or a MacBook. Um, and it doesn't make those products more valuable. Um, Bitcoin is a, functions as digital gold. And as people buy into Bitcoin via ETFs, it adds liquidity and mm -hmm. makes it function better as a store of value and uh, medium of exchange. And even eventually, um, as its price stabilizes over the long run, as a unit of account, so uh, Bitcoin's unique in that respect. You know, even, even though people buying Bitcoin via an ETF aren't directly using Bitcoin, they're, they're adding value to it. They are indirectly a kind of user. And so uh, I, I think ETFs are huge. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, besides uh, the speculative role of Bitcoin and its being as uh, investment class, it's as well considered to be a digital gold to uh, hedge against inflation. And another function of Bitcoin, it uh, as well uh, has been tooted for a long time as uh, a tool for financial inclusion. And uh, we have over 1.7 billion uh, people worldwide uh, who are in bank and they don't have access to any financial services. Uh, so in your opinion, uh, how can uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, 
and give access to, to these people or to the financial services? Um, the whole idea of Bitcoin started as a financial inclusivity, right? Uh, I got introduced to Bitcoin back <laughs> in 2013 when I was still working with IFC. And I was based out of Cairo, and I've already done a year and a half in Kenya office. And I saw that the, of the, the settlement between the official World Bank uh, Kenya office to official World Bank Tanzania office would take 10 business days. And that was like very frustrating because you can literally drive and give that money in a, within a day to the other office. And so the immediate settlement with verification and security has always, always been a problem in the standard financial system. And I think not just having the money with financial inclusivity or banking the unbanked with people who don't have to go through the whole system. Of course, we can have KYC now based on your new bank or just with your phone number accounts and create the whole credit system and credit lending system on top of it. But Bitcoin gives you that flexibility that if you are living in a country which does not have a stable political system, which is, max, which is most of the world in Africa, Latin America, a uh, lot of Asian countries, you do have a different currency than the currency promised by your government, not only to transact, but also to store as you move to a new country and start your life. I mean, uh, you have so many Bitcoin ATMs on the border of Colombia and Venezuela, just so that when people move, they can literally convert their Bitcoin into peso and start a new life. So it's one of the biggest instrument, uh, which is beyond a political influence so far for a common people. Yeah, we probably can as well count the level of Bitcoin adoption by the quantity of these Bitcoin ATMs. Yeah, and uh, actually, and just not by the governments, uh, UNHCR has uh, Bitcoin conversion ATMs in a lot of refugee centers in Greece <coughs> and Turkey now for the same reason, because they are finding a lot of people coming from Lebanon and Syria uh, having those bitcoins, which they can start their new life and support. So, yeah. Dominique, what's your take on that? Um, I think bitcoin is going to be very popular in the developing world. Um, historically, there have been some impediments, uh, mainly related relating to speed and, and transaction cost, and, and those are going to disappear. So, uh, actually, today in the developing world, uh, the most popular uh, cryptocurrency is Tether, and it's being exchanged on Tron, which is a surprise. Um, that's, that's the truth. And the reason is that um, it can be transferred at very low cost very quickly. So Bitcoin hasn't had that, and there's been the Lightning Project, which will bring down um, uh, transaction speeds and uh, cost. That has some challenges, though. You've got to lock Bitcoin in a channel. Um, the internet computer uh, has adopted a new technology called chain key, and uh, recently that was uh, used to create something called chain key Bitcoin, which is a Bitcoin twin. Um, so using the internet computer as an alternative layer two to accelerate Bitcoin and make it less expensive. And uh, now you can transfer Bitcoin with about 1.5 second finality and near negligible cost, like thousands of the cent. And um, in, in, uh, we, we already have that actually working in, in, in Lugano. So in Lugano, which is a city, a very wealthy city in Switzerland, um, you can actually pay with chain key Bitcoin alongside you know, fiat. But uh, with what we saw just before Christmas was this huge surge in uh, uh, chain key Bitcoin transactions. Uh, you know, uh, actually in China, but we we're expecting to see a surge in South America and Africa. Um, and it's really game changing when you can transfer Bitcoin so quickly and at such little, for such little cost. Um, another thing I think that will make a big difference um, is uh, something called brain wallets. So one of the challenges uh, with the developing world is that, you know, you might be put up against a wall and coerced, and somebody might say, let me see on your phone. <clears throat> Even a corrupt policeman, actually, can do the same kind of thing. Let me see on your phone, and if you've got crypto, they're going to take it. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, brain, brain wallets allow you to remember a number in your head and interact with the sort of wallet as a service credited by a smart contract. Um, 
using a private key that's in a chip inside your phone called a TPM that, that nobody can detect and, and you can't ex it can't be extracted. And this means that people can you know, use the incognito mode of their browser to send and receive Bitcoin and other kinds of crypto. And, and that will be another big boon, I think, for pe people in the developing world. So they'll be able to um, hold crypto in a way that can't be detected, um, can't be stolen by somebody coercing them, and transfer it at uh, you know, very quickly for a very low cost. So I think adoption in the developing world is coming, and it'll certainly help people that you know, don't have easy access to things like bank accounts. Yeah, Robbie. So you? I think the the way we view Bitcoin. So obviously we're a big you know game developer and entertainment company in the Web3 space. So we actually spend most of our time in the EVM or Ethereum compatible ecosystem of applications more than we actually do specifically working with Bitcoin. But Bitcoin serves as a very important kind of north star within our industry because for many people. The reason they get into Web3 to begin with is to buy Bitcoin. It's very often the first thing that you do. And then you discover a wider world of Web3 applications and other cryptocurrencies and games and other things because you got into the experience via the Bitcoin road or doorway, so to speak. So I think we, can, we kind of view Bitcoin as being that um, macroeconomic indicator for the rest of our industry. Um, when Bitcoin is doing well, it serves as a tailwind similar to interest rates or employment figures or other you know, GDP numbers, anything that you would think of economically as being kind of an economic tailwind. And so we've seen the growth in Bitcoin pricing over the last four or five months um, really serve as a tailwind for the rest of the Web3 industry. So now if you look at most Web3 projects, you know, the, the fundraising market has opened up again for Web3, which is great. Um, projects and consumer adoption and interest in projects um, has increased dramatically. So we're now, you know, feeling a lot like the atmosphere of 2021 and 2022 when it comes to momentum in the space. Um, and a lot of that is due with what was triggered originally by the Bitcoin ETF approvals and the momentum in Bitcoin. So it's very important as an underlying kind of um, uh, under, underlying tailwind underpinning the Web3 industry generally. Yes, all assets follow the king, follow Bitcoin, and uh, the mood on the market uh, as well becomes better. And Bitcoin is, is going up, and as well, we are in a completely different cycle now. We see already even countries adopting Bitcoin as a legal tender, as official currency, like uh, El Salvador or Central African Republic, where you can just go everywhere and uh, pay in Bitcoin. And these are developing countries, so as well, in many other countries, uh, where there is high inflation, like in Uruguay or Argentina, people are referring to Bitcoin uh, just as a hedge against inflation to store their assets or many other remittance uh, dependent countries uh, found uh, Bitcoin to be like a solution uh, to send money back to their families and uh, to save the fees. Uh, but as well, we see uh, besides Bitcoin, we have another asset such as NFTs, and we see the interest is coming back. And now everybody is as well telling that blockchain gaming may be the next uh, uh, catalyst uh, for the mass uh, crypto adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, so my next question is uh, back to Robbie, uh, since you are the CEO of uh, the biggest blockchain gaming and uh, Metaverse fund, Animoca Brands. Uh, so how do you see NFTs and uh, blockchain games impacting the overall mass adoption? of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? And is it like a gateway to the broader crypto expansion? Sure. So I think, um, you know, to put it briefly, the gaming market is definitely, um, you know, very strong. And we're excited because we have a tremendous amount of Web3-based um, gaming product that has now come to market over the last year and is coming over this next year, which I think are much more mature, titles of gameplay styles that people would be more familiar with from Web 2 games. I think many of the early Web 3 games um, had a lot of robust blockchain infrastructure, but maybe the gameplay was not as immersive as people would have liked. Um, so I think the, the nature of product, we're undergoing a kind of a generational shift now. So I think, you know, you'll really enjoy some of the great titles that we have coming out shortly. Um, but most importantly, we're also thinking about expanding the ways we work with these various technologies. So now, even on Bitcoin, we have the Ordinals community. Um, and the Ordinals community began with static artworks. And now, we're, you know, we have one studio that's just concentrated on making game content 
on Bitcoin um, because we're constantly trying to find new ways in which to use these technologies in, in creative fashions. I actually uh, want to add very quickly to what Robbie is saying. I know we started with this is the Bitcoin price and this is a storage value, this is the inclusivity and the payment stuff. But I want to say that the reason for, and I, I'm going to take a liberty to speak on behalf of everybody on the stage when I say that, that this is just not some sort of, like a lot of people say, a scheme, a pyramid scheme or something. Uh, Bitcoin has an underlining value with a lot of technology. So does the companies which are associated, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's Definity, uh, the, te the technical underlining part of whether you can use it as a currency for immediate settlement, whether you use, as Robbie mentioned, about a lot of technology which is getting built on it, ordinal slack, uh, stacks to have NFTs transactions on top of it, DeFi transactions which already have a liquidity of over $800 million lock within one and a half month of its uh, launch. Um, that technology play of data, the technology play of having yields like any traditional hedge fund and more is what gives and empowers it to be a very rare commodity in this space without the influence of an individual country. And Dominique, yeah. do you have anything to add? I saw you have as well partnerships with some gaming companies. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm just sort of Riffing, riffing off Robbie's comments on, on games, I, I think um, the, the future of crypto and Bitcoin specifically in games is, is bright. Um, I think the difference, the, the change that we're going to see is today, you know, games tend to, um, you know, be built on a centralized platform, bounce people out, and you do a transaction, uh, crypto for an NFT. And I think what we'll see is games adopting a full stack decentralization uh, a model of full stack decentralization so the game runs on chain and this will transform the way cryptos mm -hmm. appear in games so for example um, you know uh, while you're interacting with the game uh, a balance of bitcoin that you somehow will receive goes up and down depending on your actions and there won't be any interaction with a wallet because it won't be necessary so crypto will become integrated into game logic in, in much the same way um, that you saw and in much the same way you saw the score move when you played Space Invader many years ago. Yes. Uh, if you're that old, um, you're going to see a balance of different cryptos going up and down as you play the game because they're going to be fully integrated. And that's uh, programmable magic internet money at work. Mm. Thank you. I think we are running out of time, but I think we are still quite early. There are only around 300 million crypto users worldwide, and uh, this number is predicted to grow uh, two, three times more by the end of this year. And even by the end of our panel, Bitcoin pumped $500 more. It's already $58,983, so it may even break the 59000 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Great. okay, give a round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much.